Hi, I'm Randy White. Welcome to On the Water. Today we're on Chukaloski Island at historic Smallwood store, right at the gate of Florida's 10,000 islands and the wilderness coast of the Everglades. You know, people say that uh, Florida has lost its native voice, that Florida really is one of the north's southernmost states. Well, today we're going to prove wrong because we have one of the real great original voices. Our guest today is a man who's lived uh, more than 70 years in these islands. He's made his living off the land as a commercial fisherman, as a gator hunter, as a drug runner. Uh, he's also a writer of country music, and he's, he's the author of his own autobiography. Uh, our guest today is Totch Brown. Totch, great to have you Hi, with us. Hi, Randy. I'm really looking forward to it. What are we going to do today? Well, first off, I'm hearing your top guide up around Fort Myers now. <laughs> You've been talking <laughs> to some relatives, I'll tell you. Well, anyhow, we'll go down through the islands and look over a lot of the <clears throat> shell mound, or some of them very interesting, how they're placed and old. And over the mounds where I live through the years, camping from day to day, and on down to Chatham Bend River, the Watson Place. The place you wrote a song about. Yeah. I hope we can hear that. My favorite Chatham Bend. Yeah. The song, Living There in My Teens, I guess is some of my best life. We'll come on out to uh, Chatham Bend River and up the coast and back to the island. See some stuff and tell some stories, okay? Yeah. Well, let's, get, let's hop in the boat and get on the water, man. We ought to catch a few manatees. <laughs> Troubles, but I call him Trub, and <laughs> to call her I say, chum on Troubles, and does she ever come. Well, where, where are we going to head today? Well, we'll probably go down through the inside country, and on down through Plate Creek and Gator Bay and out Lost Man's River. Ooh, that would be good. And come back the outside, down the Gulf, Sand Beaches. Well, I've been looking forward to this for a long time. I brought my fly rod, but I'm not going to use it unless something comes right up and jumps in my face. But <coughs> I don't believe you can make a day without using it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm ready if you are. I hope you do. I'm afraid I couldn't find my way if I didn't have this chart. Yeah, yeah, I know. After what? How many years have you been down here? 71 so far. Well, I'm glad I did bring the chart then. <laughs> 71 so far. May I have to pull back, Randy? <laughs> I don't mind. <laughs> you you pulled that before, that uh, Lost Man's to Chukaloski route before, yeah, haven't you? Yeah, Cape Sable. That's right, you had to pull clear from Cape Sable to Chukaloski yeah, once. Yeah, 50 miles. Good lordy. <laughs> and you didn't have any food? Well, we had food for two weeks carried with us, but we were there three. <laughs> we had to make out. We ate a lot of swamp cabbage. Had to walk two miles through the mangroves to get to the cave for the cabbage. Just to get the swamp cabbage. I tried coon, but I couldn't cut that. So it made, made you a little sick. Yeah. Now, uh, we're coming up on something here at Chukaloski Island. It's, uh, Kind of a local landmark, this well, we could store here. Trying to make a detour in by that. That's the old small wood trading post. And uh, my grandfather McKinney, T 
turned over the post office to Smallwood in 1906, and it was there for many years, but some years back they've moved it to another place on the island. But this is becoming a historical site. They're working hard on it now. And all those old engines piled out there we'll see is motors we used for our boats. We couldn't afford marine motors. Out here you're talking about? No. Oh. Over here right by here. the dock. So oh, we, we'd go to Miami and Fort Myers and buy old junk motors, $25 a piece. Car motors? Yeah. Run them a year or so and throw them overboard and get another one. The reason they're all piled there is he was the only man who had a boom to hoist them out. out. See them in here? And that's the, the Smallwood store. Yeah, this is where Watson was killed. Ed Bloody Watson. Yeah. Whereabouts was he shot, Totch? Uh, I kind of believe over on the just to the left side of the building. <clears throat> that was our ways also for dry docking. Mr. Smallwood had a cradle came down on the railroad irons to pull the boats up with an old one-cylinder motor for power with the big fly wheels, yeah. two of them, pop about once a minute. Popped about once a minute. And there's been some difference in that place since the road in 56. How's that? I don't believe there was over 135 people on the island before the road. Well, I, I was one of the few that refused to vote for the road, uh, signed the petition. They pumped in that road between Everglades City yeah. and Chuckalowski. I loved it just like it was. We made our own laws, done our own thing, and it's like one big happy family. Now it's about half trailer park, you name it. The people still seem real nice down here. Yeah, I'd still rather be there than any place in the world. And Never there. go anywhere I'd rather be than here. I was just seeing the difference in the fish out there and today. Yeah. When Dollar and I started the crabbing, we pull up that trap and there would be black bunches of snapper and all different uh, smaller fish. When you first start stone up, crabbing. Yeah. And uh, eating the bait. So the bait wouldn't last overnight. So many little fish going in there and eating up the bait. Dollar came up with the idea of using uh, these old bull conks for bait. They're tough. They were so thick we went out there my wife, Estelle, and Dollar and I, and picked up 200 in one evening, knocked a hole in the end, let the air in, pulled out the meat like the Indians did, and baited them with that. And uh, today, when you pull up a trap, you never see a fish. That's how they deplenished, and Dollar and I had 200 traps in the end. Uh, we run around 600 pounds a day, pulling the same trap every day by hand. Today, with hydraulic pullers, two of them, they're pulling seven or 800 traps a day. They got 4,000 traps up to the boat, and they're producing less crabs than we were. But they don't pull the same trap but about once a week. Yeah. Sad part of when we started, we used dried coconuts for buoys. There was no plastic, and the buoys sunk on us. Some bad <laughs> weather came, we couldn't get out. The buoys sunk, got hung on the pearl oysters and whatever, and we lost all but the eight sample traps with gill neck corks on them. But I'd proved to the bank that the crabbing was going to be the thing, and they let me have money to build another 200. Now, what year was that, Todd? 46, just after it came out of the service. Battle of the Bulge. Yeah, and we couldn't sell the crabs. Stop the real Stone Crab Joe helped Miami. us out enough that we made it through the year, and I made enough money to pay off the mortgage on the home I bought when it came out of the service. 
still living there today. That's the and famous the restaurant in Miami. Here, pardon me? That's the famous restaurant in Miami, Stone Crab yeah. Joe's. The following year, a few got into the business, and you couldn't sell them, and I sold out. I never tried it again until 70. I done it a little in, again in 70. <clears throat> I will say that I found them, and Billy Raphael caught them. <laughs> He's the best. Mouth of it, and ahead of us is the Shell Mound, called the Turner's River Place. My mother was born there in 1892. On that little shell mound there. Yeah, that's where Grandfather McKinney first stopped. Then eventually he went to Chukalusky, but first he went on up to this head of this river. It goes all the way to 41, and that's about the end of it. And there's a, usually a mound or a hammock at the head of these rivers and where the Calusa Indians, whoever built them. And they had abandoned that place. They'd done a lot of farming. But Grandpa decided he'd go try it. He went up and tried it, and everything came up beautiful and green, but in a few days it just wilted. So he left there and found out why the Indians did and called it need help. He said <laughs> the ground needed help. <laughs> It's carried that name ever since. There's a cistern out there, a water tank. You're talking about the hammock back on up. Pardon me? You're talking about the hammock on up no, there. No, right straight right in right there. Here. Yeah. The field lies right out in there. And uh, the house family, old timers that uh, Peter Masson mentioned in his book. Killing Mr. Watson. Lived there many years. And uh, the small woods on this property, and I think these shell mounds on around the point. But the park appraised it and took it. Wow. On around the point, starting right here, there's little high shell mounds about 10 foot apart, one right after the other for close to a mile. And I've never been able to figure out why they done it that way. Same thing on Dismal Key. It's very odd, isn't it? Yeah. Very I odd. don't remember seeing the ones on Dismal Key. It's like this. It's. Yeah, well, this, that's right. This is the same thing. It's, uh, it's so many of them, and they're just the same distance apart, and it doesn't look like they even lived up there on them. I guess they were building. Now those mounds are probably how old, Dodge? Before Christ, according to the books. <clears throat> People lived in these islands for a long, long time. I was looking in the encyclopedia, and they didn't speak of these exact mounds, but Central Florida and there, they definitely believe they were before Christ. <clears throat> They swim with their tail up and down rather than like a fish. That way you can tell when you see a manatee whirl in the water. Uh -huh. You see a bowl like that. See it over there? Over to your right. Coming over our way right now. Right there. there. You see those bowls ahead of you, you know it's a manatee. Yeah, about a head. What they're doing is sticking to this hoe. There's little a little deep, deep hole here. here in shallow water out, and they don't want to leave this hoe. Got nowhere to go, do They'll they? They'll blow there in a minute, but you probably won't see anything but the nose hose. One right here. Boy, they're just thick in here. I believe he's fixing to rise. I used to eat these in the old days, didn't you, Tot? You see the, uh, yeah, but not that much. We hated to kill them, of course, but there was times you had to. Uh, do things you didn't want to do, you had to eat. Well, you didn't have any stores living out on these islands, did you? Pardon me? You didn't have any stores living out on these islands. <clears throat> That's right. There wasn't no hamburger joint around the corner, or no 7-Eleven, and if there had been, you wouldn't have had the money. What did manatee <clears throat> taste like? I'd say, see, see him blow? Yeah, there's one coming up. I'd say between pork and beef. 
About the only time we killed them much was while we were on a fish strike. And it was really hard going. What do you think the answer is to saving the manatee, Todd? I mean, here they're, they're all, they're, we've must seen five or six of them. They're all right here in this narrow little boat channel. Yeah, that's bad. <clears throat> the answer to that is as hard as the answer to saving everything else around here. Answers are hard to come by for a lot of these problems. And you can't hardly help any of it without hurting somebody. There they are. Can keep going straight? Right there, see him? Got right him? there. Got him? Yeah. See him? Yeah. Okay, great. See There's him? another one right there. Another one there, I got it. While the big crowd down the rivers are getting drunk on sea grape wine. I'm getting high watching eagles fly, having myself a time. Wet my whistle every now and then with a sip of cool Gatorade. And watch the sun go down, let the world go round, down in the Everglades. There ain't gonna be no hurry. Well, Randy, that's the old Lopez place. Well, tell me about the Lopez's, Todd. McKinney wrote in his little autobiography that Lopez was his, one of his first neighbors. Came over from Spain, married an American lady. Settled here around 1890 and raised his family. The little uh, troughs on the side of the cistern was for the hogs and uh, cows to get water. Now, did they use the cisterns for what? Catch their rainwater. We all had to do that. We call the tank that holds the water a cistern. Had gutters on the shack or whatever you had to gutter it in. And you get some water, just rain falling in it if it didn't have a top. And there's the tamarind tree I used to climb, get the tamarinds when we were coming after fresh water to make the moonshine coming from <laughs> Houston River. Now the tamarind, Today it's a designated campground. Now what'd you use the tamarinds for? Those are the long bead-like pods, right? Off yeah. the tamarind tree. They're just uh, another fruit that's good to eat. And we particular back then, particularly back then, <coughs> using to make an aid, tamarind aid. I was a uh, about 11, 12 years old. Mother would stir that up for me, and even though we were shy on sugar, it's probably better to meet than a milkshake for these kids today. Of course, you had a lot of ice to go on that, didn't you? Yeah, no. <laughs> it was a hard life back then down these islands. You didn't have any bug spray either, did you? No, we called it Skeeter Day. The only thing we had was Centronella and very little of that and didn't have it often. There's a black buttonwood tree. The dead part makes a good smudge pot, smoke. That would help a little bit, but not that good. We just had to learn to live with them. And there's a difference if you just know you've got to endure them and go ahead than if you're out here trying to use this fly rod you've got. And there's some ways if you learn to prevent them from being around. Strong smells cooking at a bad time, like it's sundown and dark's the worst time for mosquitoes. Moonlight nights and any thicket, any dark. Mosquitoes go for dark like wow, like black clothes. Mm -hmm. You can step out on that shell mound there, and if you're in black, they'll just swarm you. Whereas if you're in white, you won't see that many on you. There's well, that's good advice. So you used to climb that tree when you were a boy, huh? Yeah. About 31, 2, and probably about 31 and 2 in the Depression. Even a tamarind went good then, Randy. <laughs> <laughs> there wasn't no Milky Ways around the corner, and your pocket wasn't full of quarters. 
From what I've seen, you'll be an expert with that pole, Randy. <laughs> on TV. Well, see this group right here? Hey, there we got a couple. So many of them right there. You got plenty now. Well, These are, uh, they're good when they're ripe. Got the big seed. I hope but these are ripe. As kids, yeah, they're perfect. As kids, we like them as good or better. Mixing up salt and pepper and dunk them in it. There's an old tamarind tree on Chukaluski, and after school, all the kids went to that tamarind tree. The problem, when any of us was up to a little something wrong, the family knew where all the kids were. <laughs> They'd run out there and find us smoking a little bull arm or something rolled up in my paper bag. <laughs> but these are really good. They really go for them in uh, South America. Style, like a crocodile, laying in the mangrove brush. I'll float on down. The tops were up the, the headwaters of the... We're in Lopus River still. And you, we're, we're beginning to come out of Lopus River. Didn't, you, didn't someone chase you up here once upon a time? <laughs> yeah. One, was, one of many who chased you once yeah, upon a time? Yeah, I was coming in, had a little pit pan, I call it, eight-foot boat had been out dragging across the Everglades, alligator hunting in the lakes in dry season. You were po <clears throat> poaching alligators. Yeah, you call it poaching, I was just <laughs> taking them. <laughs> okay, okay. Anyhow, when I got in this end of Bay Sunday, it's just after dark, park ranger started in behind me, probably about 10 o'clock at night. He could outrun me, so I had to outmaneuver him some way. And up ahead of us, I passed by a sandbank, threw out some of my gators, just as I was traveling. I never even stopped trying to get rid of them. And then right here, there's a high sandbank. Two ways to go back to Chukalusky Bay. You can go out here to the right or go back down Lopez Road. But I pulled up right, near that sandbank and then made a hard right and the ranger right behind me and he piled her right up on the sandbank. <laughs> I went on around the point and hid my pit pan to balance some of my gator hides and made it on in. But when I got to the island, how in the world he managed to be there, I don't know, but time I got to my dock, he was there. He, we both met at my dock. I don't know how, I was burning lights all good and top shape. He just knew I was the feller that he was chasing, but he didn't know how. The only thing he knew is that I'd pull the wool over his eyes one more time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Todd. <laughs> House Amok Bay uh, coming up there, and we camped around in Houston River and then a little bay known as Liquor Still Bay and House Hammock Bay. Little used, creek running into it. You used to live here? Yeah. Just lived right out on the land like an Indian. But anyhow, this was along about 32. Uh, in the Depression, times were really hard. And, uh, that Christmas, we had a little old red mangrove tree for a Christmas tree. And uh, somehow, mother and dad managed to get me a little pocket knife for Christmas. And the very next day, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> dad shot a squawk in there, one of the birds we ate. A squawk a was heron. a night heron. Yeah. Uh, he shot one in there to eat. We went in to get it, and I dropped that knife overboard, and I could see Mother crying. Right. So I never passed this point. I don't think about that knife and the Christmas tree at Combine. I sure. named it Knife Bar. There's an oyster bar there. We call an oyster bed an oyster bar. Uh -huh. I never pass that point. I don't think about that and knife. And you used to live 
lived up there in that bay right in this end. We made our own high land. Dad was making it really while we were camping around the point here at Houston Campground. And I'll show you up here where I made a little island. And how old were you then? 10 and 12. About little league age. Yeah. Uh, we got the oysters from around here off the oyster beds, dead, live, whatever, to make the higher land. He picked out a little place that was a little higher than some of it. A lot of good trees for cover, but we didn't have to worry much about airplanes. There wasn't any then. Now, what did your dad use to make moonshine? What kind of vegetables? Uh, he used corn. Came in 100-pound bags. We call it corn sacks, burlap bags. Put a half a sack of corn and a half a sack of sugar, 100-pound bag, to a barrel of water. But he couldn't afford the barrels when we started, so he used my brother's 18-foot fish skiff. <laughs> he leveled it up and poured all that goulash in there and it made the buck, we call it buck beer, that you boil and uh, alcohol boils first, for, so the first that came out is the strongest. And the problem was that the buck beer ate all the paint off of the skiff. Probably add some flavor to the whiskey though, didn't it? Yeah. Then uh, he made some cement vats and the buck beer ate all the uh, plaster off of that. He even tried plaster <laughs> Paris and it ate that. The reason he made the vats, there came some bugs he named prohibition bugs prohibition. that went into all of the barrels and little teeny things, little on a matchstick, and just got them all to leaking. So he eventually stopped that by wrapping chicken wire around them and plastering the whole barrel of cement. Uh, he did all that right in here? Yeah. Right back in this? Yeah, and then he hid, after he made whiskey, he hid it around about a mile from camp in little barrels to char, charred barrels with oak chips to color it and age it. Yeah. <clears throat> Went around there one day and found them leaking. Them bugs is drunk again. <clears throat> but this time he plastered the whole bag, the plug, bung and all, and put a little X where the the bung was. Bung hole, yeah. yeah, just hit that with a hammer and broke the plaster, pulled out the plug, took Ma's syringe hose, there was no little hoses in, and siphoned it out into the jugs. So when we got to Chatham Bend, he buried 50 two 50-gallon barrels of it to age it. That was the most aged shine ever in this country. And he called it bush lightning. Yeah, my grandfather McKinney named it bush lightning. And the mosquito swamp angels. But anyhow, to get that whiskey out of those barrels of buried in the cane patch, he put a little copper tubing in the bong bored a hole in it and run the tubing all the way to the bottom of the barrel, screwed an inner tube valve in the, the barrel, and just take a car pump and hit that thing a couple of times with that syringe hose from the tubing <laughs> over to the uh -huh. jug and the prettiest whiskey I ever did see come out of it. So we're going to go down to Chatham Bend now. Well, we'll go around here. I'll show you Camp Houston where I live. Oh, I want to see that, yeah. Uh, that's a dear place to me. I got my first shotgun there. We Let's were go. trapping raccoons and killing alligators and fire hunting at night, headlight and shotgun for alligators and coons. While we were there, Dad was cutting boat timbers, natural crook, out of the <clears throat> buttonwood trees, some Madeira. And at the same time, he was setting up this still around here. You see this little key down here? Mm -hmm. All right, there's where we got a lot of the oysters to make the shell mound. And I took the divers, we call them, mangrove bobs, the seeds from the right. mangrove trees, and stuck a whole bunch of them up in that oyster bar. 
Yeah. Turned out to be that key. You started that little island yeah. right there. Touch Brown Island. Yeah. Did you have a house here or what? Not a thing. We just slept right on the ground. We had a little bit of a lean-to to keep a little of the rain off and get up and roll up the bed and when it rained, sit it out in the mosquitoes. Had a mosquito bar, mosquito net, we call it a bar. Touch, I'm trying to picture me bringing my wife, who loves, who loves the outdoors, and my two <coughs> sons who love the outdoors here and living it. It would be hard. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's rough in there. Well, it's however you come up, Randy. Like if you was to give uh, one of these young women today an old-time boil pot like we had out in the backyard, build a fire under and boil the water to wash clothes, the old hard octagon soap and a punch stick, I don't guess they'd know what to do with it. Somebody dug this canal? Yeah. Who in the world would have done that? Well, uh, some companies came down and thought they were going to drain the islands, I guess. There's marshes out there. They dug that canal and two or three more back of us down Chatham Bend River, and one in particular in Alligator Bay. Goes all the way nearly to the Cypress country. And up this canal is a prairie. We call it Watson Prairie because it's in the back of the Watson place. To me, it's Chatham Bend, the Watson place. Anyhow, out there is where we kept it burned, and the game was so plentiful, we'd go out there and kill all we wanted for eating purposes. What kind of, what kind of game? Curlew, in particular, and uh, you call white it? ibis is a curlew, yeah. a chuckalusky chicken. <laughs> there is a curlew, but it isn't this white ibis. And uh, a lot of ducks, coots, uh, teals, different ones, particularly the mallard summer duck, stays year round, and deer. But when we quit burning because of the park, it all grew into a swamp. Tall grass and the prairie and the game is there no more. You think because of the natural burn? burn. Now, yeah. we kept these places burned, and the game was, you wouldn't believe how plentiful it was. Now, I'm not arguing to burn up there in the pine land. That's a different story altogether. But burning in this mud, wet, marsh lands is what kept the game here. It kept the ponds open from growing up with mangroves and the ducks would migrate down by the thousands. The birds, the, every animal would go to those little ponds, just thrived on it as it was drying up. Mm -hmm. Everything. The smallest little crawdab fish or whatever go to the ponds, and one eating on the other right on up, to the alligator eating on all of them. But, but you... there's nothing out there now but a grown-up swamp. You used to eat a lot of white ibis. Yeah, that was one of our main diets. Uh, the ibis and the deer, turtles. But nothing beats the curlew in this country of the wildlife we ate. That's the best. Their breast is so thick that you have to slice it, split it, to fry it. Uh, one bird is a little more than the average man would eat. The brown ones are especially good fried, but they're the young bird, friars. And you mean the white ibis? Yeah. Now you've spent most of your life, you've made a living off this land and on the land. And for not just yourself, but for other men and women in the 10,000 Islands areas, the Everglades. They became involved in uh, smuggling marijuana, never cocaine or anything like no, that. No, but... never anything but marijuana. Why, why the transition? Why did we start doing it? Yeah. Well, I think it was a lot of different things. Commercial fishing's been going down for many years. The sale of mullet never did come up, the price, as I call it, to match everything else and they even got to where you can't sell them that good, except to the, something started. 
uh, caviar, the yellow roe, but that's only three weeks of the year. And they banned fishing in the, in the national park. And they Didn't banned it, the fishing in the park, but the restrictions began to hurt because it was we were being hurt anyhow. Commercial fishing was just going down. Uh, Pompanoan went down, to my opinion, because of finding stone crabs, Florida lobster, crawfish, and shrimp. That became the delicacy. And then you couldn't sell Pompano, nothing like we used to. We used to a lot of us go Pompano. And then on the crabbing, it cost uh, $100,000, $200,000 to get into it. So many can't afford that. So there was people there that just had to do something. And the first load that went through, we wanted to hang him. But first then we found wanted. out that it was only something to smoke that probably didn't do any more harm than tobacco or alcohol, probably not as much. Uh, we shouldn't have done it, but then it was just another way of survival, and we didn't expect to get caught because of the islands and all, us knowing it's so good, there's no way an outsider could possibly catch us. And the we'll way get they, an example of that today, Joy. <laughs> I tried to follow you in that chart, and I was lost immediately. The way they finally done it, uh, got it stopped was with rats, as I call them, people talking, telling on the other. Now they, um, in, in a good year fishing for Pompano, or even uh, selling gator skins, what, how much approximately would somebody make? A year, yeah. probably around 15000 and then, uh, it probably wasn't that much way back, but nothing was that much way back. But in the later years, on the 60s, uh, probably around 15, maybe some of the good producers, 20. And in a typical year running marijuana, how much would you make? Well, that's, uh, <laughs> that's kind of a hard question there. There's a lot of ways to be involved. You could be hauling your own or hiring your own haul or just being an offloader or whatever, but someone that's really in the business could make a million. And did you just run your boat over to Columbia without knowing a soul or? No, as for myself, I started out as an offloader and I got acquainted with the dealer. And uh, the dealer finally took me to the cleaners, took everything I had. I just went broke again after working for a long time with him, planning to retire. But I picked up phone numbers and names of people and got in touch with them in Columbia that way and went down and I found a, someone I just figured I could trust. I think I'm pretty good at figuring a man out. And he could speak a lot of languages, so him and I went to Columbia and I rode right up the mountainsides on the donkeys and got out there and picked out the marijuana we wanted. And them fellas walking around there with a 38 stuck on their bare skin between their belt. But having that Colombian with me saved me, I'm sure. There were they was places that pull up a chain across the road, nothing but to rob you, but they would claim it was government or state. Right, yeah, well, they still do that, don't they? Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and you never got caught? No, they got me on tax invasion. But he's talking something, uh, he mentioned a while ago about the hard drugs. Uh, one time we unloaded also from freighters rather than going all the way to, uh, if you went all the way to Columbia on your own boats, like shrimp boats, you made much, much more money out of it. Picking it up out here with a shrimp boat or a yacht or a crab boat or something, you made much less off of the freighter, 150 miles out or something. And one of my captains running one of my boats 
after he got 10,000 pounds of marijuana loaded on the boat, the captain of that freighter came out there with a big box full of coke, handed it to the captain. He just pushed it back, says, my captain says we don't haul drugs. <laughs> All right. Well, and you spent a couple of years in uh, jail, didn't you? Yeah, about 20 months, but 11 months of that was because I wouldn't testify against my friends and neighbors. I had an 18-month sentence, but I proved beyond a reasonable doubt I'd die before I testify, and they had to release me. And then uh, the judge reduced my sentence a couple of, original sentence a couple of years. Uh, under the circumstances, they knew I wasn't going to talk when they put me in there. Uh, but uh, I deserved every day I made, and I don't know how one could be treated any better and still be punished than I was while I was in prison. They treated you well there. I don't know how you could possibly be punished and be treated any better <laughs> for the wrongs we do. <laughs> it's probably a much easier life than down here in the islands, wasn't it? <laughs> Randy, there's something, there's something about that that's like an alcoholic taking a drink. It isn't just the money. I don't know what it is, but it's just something that gets a hold of you that you just can't. You're not even through offloading before you're done figuring out how you're going to do the next one. Well, Tarta, I get the impression you like being chased through these islands. That's just my... <laughs> well, it's quite a kick to outdo them. I get the impression you like knowing no one can catch you back in here. <laughs> <laughs> and nobody can. I, I don't swear to that. <laughs> well, I never did. They never did catch it. Yeah, the best trip I made, when we got to the gap, we call it the gap, it's between Yucatan and Columbia, was the most dangerous place the Coast Guard could set up out there, or get out there in their ship and radar all the way across it, about 100 miles across it. Well, I had a good talk with my captains and got it all squared away before we took off on that trip. And before, and had a radio frequency no one else could hear. So I sent, I call it a dummy boat, through the gap just before the boat load got there. Well, this dummy boat went right down through the gap in the middle of the daytime and met the other boat some 30, 40 miles away where they couldn't radar them and switched captains. I didn't want the captain on that boat caught that was bringing the load. I had reasons for not wanting him involved, so switch captains, and then the dummy boat comes back through, and the boat load stays. Well, the dummy boat goes through just at the time we always did, about 9 o'clock at night, and the Coast Guard, of course, had caught on to that. He was traveling right where they usually travel, and the Coast Guard nailed him. Well, while they were messing with that boat, that gave the other crew a chance. And, but instead of chancing it that night, they waited. And fortunately, the next day, it was a heavy rain, and they went right down through the middle of the gap. You can't radar much in the rain. Instead of cutting across for Key West after they came through the gap, they went up the west coast of the Gulf, way on up towards Texas, and then come back down just like a shrimp boat coming from Texas. Come out there and unloaded it all just fine. They went back to Key West, uh, Sloppy Joe's. <laughs> that was my last run. And it was a dandy. <laughs> So this is where Ed Bloody Watson had yeah. his plantation. This is where he done his business. And he used to live here for a while too, right, Todd? Yeah, I guess I lived here about two years and 
two years over in the Houston Bay country. We left there and came here, and here we had the old Watson home to live in. And how old were you when you lived here? I guess about 12. Left when I was just getting around 14. Went back to Chukalusky. And we made sugar cane here. Yeah. Dad uh, put the cement all around the old kettle out there. It's still there. Uh, we made uh, sugar cane syrup. Planted cane all out in the field by hand. Well, let's get out, Meg, and show me where some okay. stuff was. So has the place changed much since you lived here? I noticed a lot of the land's falling away up there on the Ponciana trees, about half of them. Half of the roots are out in the water, and the old dock was further down where all those bushes are. Oh. It was more of a big platform-like where Watson piled out his freight, sailed it to Key West. And uh, <clears throat> the mill grinding for grinding the cane was over here. The old engine still there. Most of the mills were turned by hand with a long pole, either a man pushing it around or a mule. But Watson was crafty enough, he set him up a one cylinder motor out there. And when we came, Dad uh, was a good mechanic. He got the motor to running, but the gunner was broke. And one of my Uncle Doc's boys, Uncle Doc and his family lived here, Clarence Brown. Uh, one of him, his boys, he taught him how to take the spark plug wire off mm -hmm. and act as governor. Take the plug <laughs> wire off every now and then, slow it down, so yeah. Dad named him the governor. The place was up here. The uh, cement blocks are still there. Now, Ed, Watson, Ed Watson's the man who supposedly killed Bell Star and supposedly murdered a number of other people. That's why they call him Ed Bloody Watson. Yeah, and I kind of believe that he may have had to do with uh, Bell Star. Some say nobody knows who actually killed her, but from all I heard of my father and people that really knew Watson, my mother came and stayed with Miss Watson a lot. <clears throat> I can't believe Watson had to do, really had to do with killing a Bell Star. But he killed a lot of different people. They found people floating in the river here where he'd sank them down with chains or something, but their bodies didn't stay. Hannah this, Smith and a couple of others. Now, yeah. your dad did the cement work in this? Yeah. Uh, he was a professional with cement, and instead of laying a piece of tin up or something to help the fire, he would never go that route. He put those cement blocks. Watson had left a lot of blocks. And uh, you see how neat he rounded it off on top. That was a nice job right here. The old motor set here. And uh, the grinder for the mill set over there, or vice versa. And somebody's hauled off the grinder. I was so sorry of that. And there's where Watson was buried. This key, Rabbit Key, but he was only there a couple of days or so, and I guess some of his family had him, uh, his body dug up and moved, I don't know, Fort Myers mm -hmm. someplace. I've seen that, I've seen the grave site. Do um, you know whereabouts he was buried on Rabbit Key? No, I had no idea. I heard they tied a rope to him and left the, the rope trailing out of the hole. I saw that, but I don't believe it. Doesn't make a lot of I sense. just saw that a few days ago in some old book, but uh, I don't... These people here wasn't like that thing you see in the movies. I don't think they done that. I think they put him in the ground and there wasn't no rope tied to him. Pretty religious community. Chuckle Very much. He used to. Uh, Back in those days, I'd say most every family had at least one member religious. And it, they're strong believers, Church of God. 
Well, we've shoved on to Chukaloski from here, I guess. Sounds pretty good. It's a pretty island. Watch out, trouble. Why do you think they brought him clear out here? That's a wrong way to... <laughs> well, I've heard people say that they didn't want a character like him buried in their graveyard <laughs> on Chukaloski. And that sounds pretty well right. Touch, I can't remember when I've enjoyed a boat trip more, and I mean it. I really want to thank you for being on the show. Well, I'm so glad you enjoyed it. You're a wonderful guest, and I learned a lot today. Anytime. Just come down, we'll dig off again. <laughs> I hope you folks learned something today, too. Hope you learned something about the Florida voice and a little island at the edge of the Everglades called Chukaloski. I'm Randy White, and I hope to see you next week on the water. By the neon lights in New York Harbor, I rig myself for the cold north wind. Won't take them down till I reach Crown Hollow. The warm little cold for trade winds blow near Chatham Bend. Did you ever hear of Chatham River? It's way down south where I was raised. Sweet water flows in that old salt river. It winds its way from Oyster Bay to the Everglades. If I could fly like a big bald eagle, I'd fill my wings with southbound wind But I can't fly, I'm a sailor dreaming Norwester drove me home to Chatham Bend The tide goes out in New York Harbor I ride her out to the waterway I aim my bow for stone crowd collar If the winds don't fail, I'll drop my sails in 15 days Nobody knows how I've missed that river The mangrove trees, daddy's sea grape wine the swimming hole, my little old John boat. It'll be so good eating mama's cooking one more time. If I could fly like a big bald eagle, I'd fly away to Chatham Bend. When I touch down in Stone Crow Hollow. I'd clip my wings and never, ever fly again. I'll drop my sails in Chatham River and never leave old Chatham Bend again.